Hey guys, I'm super excited that you joined me today and I've got a very special guest that's joining us. I know many of us as house cleaners have always been really sensitive to cleaning chemicals. And when we think of cleaning chemicals, oftentimes we're thinking of our health in terms of things that we eat and things that we drink. And we're not thinking of things that we associate with that we touch or breathe. And so today it's a really important conversation that I've been dying to have for a very, very long time. And I want to read the introduction for Gabriella because I'm just not going to remember all of the amazing things that she does. And then I promise I won't read to you anymore. We'll just jump into a live conversation. But Gabrielle Rosa is the founder and director of the Rosa Institute. It's an organization dedicated to improving clinical outcomes and advancing scientific knowledge in reproductive medicine. It's to help couples overcome fertility challenges and conceive healthy babies. I know, awesome, right? Since 2001, she and her team have blended evidence-based science with a holistic and educational focused approach to fertility treatment, resulting in the development of the F-E-R-T-I-L-E, fertile method. It's a unique methodology that boasts a 78.8% live birth rate for couples with a history of infertility miscarriage, or failed treatments. The Institute has provided reproductive education and empowerment to over 140,000 couples in more than 110 countries worldwide. Gabriella is a renowned fertility specialist. She's the author and program director for the Fertility Breakthrough Program. Her two decades of knowledge and experience have been distilled into four books on natural fertility solutions, two of which have become bestsellers. I know, and she's joining us today. How cool is this, right? Her latest book, Fertility Breakthrough, Overcoming Infertility and Recurrent Miscarriage When Other Treatments Have Failed is a valuable resource for couples struggling to conceive for over two years or facing difficulties in maintaining a healthy pregnancy. Her academic achievements include a master's in public health, clinical effectiveness from Harvard's University T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where she received the Scholar Award for Academic Excellence. She's currently pursuing Harvard's uh, Doctor of Public Health program and holds a Master's of Science in Medicine, Reproductive Health, and Human Genetics, and a Bachelor of Health Science. Gabriella is trained in various health disciplines, including neuropathy, nutrition, and botanical herbal medicine. She's got all the goods here, you guys. I'm so excited. Gabrielle is featured in major publications and is a respected educator, podcast host, and radio comment commentator on health, wellness, and fertility. Her podcast, Talk Sex with Gabriella Rosa, explores a holistic conversation around desire, pleasure, and satisfaction, guiding individuals on a journey of self-discovery, whether they're on the fertility journey or not. Gabriella is joining us today to have a conversation with me about cleaning chemicals and fertility, and she's here to answer your questions. Please help me welcome Gabriella Rosa. I am so excited to be here. Thank you, Angela. Gosh, that that uh, that uh, bio makes me blush. <laughs> Well, you are certainly talented and skilled in areas of which I've had a lifelong curiosity because as a house cleaner, when we talk about cleaning chemicals, it's something that affects us all. And mm. many homeowners will use cleaning chemicals randomly yeah. and professional house cleaners use them all day, every day. Yeah. So this yeah. is a huge conversation. So thank you for uh, joining us. Oh, my pleasure. No, when I saw, you know, the title of, of your podcast, I'm like, okay, I need to go and educate. <laughs> you know, I need to share some light because you're absolutely right. You know, like so many different things that we are exposed to in our day to day that we think, you know, oh, okay, it's available on the shelf of a supermarket. Of course it's healthy, but is it, you know, so I get what you're saying. Well, I'm curious, there's something in your life that triggered something that made you decide to go down this path. Share with us what it was and how you got here. Well, I was a cleaner at one point. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so when I was studying, I was like, you know what, 
what is the easiest way, most productive, and certainly, you know, the the least hassling kind of way to make some extra cash to pay for uh, for school. And cleaning was just such a fabulous, you know, part of it. And at the time, and I guess, you know, my my parents, I'm I'm Brazilian by background. You know, I was raised in Australia. I was born and raised in Brazil, and then my parents were immigrated to Australia, and I lived, lived there for more than thirty years of my life. But as you can probably imagine, you know, from a Latina mother, it's very much a situation of like, you know, go clean, girl. Um, and and we just had, we were just brought up with just, you know, really good cleaning abilities. So, but I think that what brought me to doing the kind of work today is very much this essence of wanting people, wanting to help people transform. You know, for me, transformation is that the core of what it is that I do. And as you can imagine, you know, when treating couples who have been struggling with infertility, struggling with miscarriage, there's a huge amount of transformation that's required there for us to be able to get an outcome of a healthy baby, especially when they've, you know, been trying for many, many years and other treatments has failed. So uh, that's the passion for me. You know, that's the thing that really kind of, it, it gets me up in the morning, it keeps me up late at night and it keeps me doing it for what's now 22 years. You know, it's, wow. it's been a long time. Well, what is the connection between cleaning chemicals and fertility? You know, that is such a great question. And, and, you know, the really important thing that I want people to take away from this conversation is that you can't isolate fertility. You can't isolate reproductive health, hormonal health. You know, so many times when we have a problem, like let's say you have a sore finger, right, and it's infected. Let's just give that as an example. That finger, you might put, you know, topical treatment and you might put things on it that is going to help to heal from the outside in. But the truth of the matter is that that finger is part of a greater system, okay? And the fact that that finger became infected to begin with is a flag to what else perhaps may be going on underneath the the radar so to speak you know inside the system of that person because what happens is that you know I always talk about the fact that every system is the is designed for delivering the outcome that it's delivering and this is true in the human body as well as life you know it, as well as cleaning houses i mean think about it if you have a, you have a system everybody has a system in, in which they go about doing things and if the outcome is not what you want you have to question okay what is the process what is the system and so what happens is you know in a roundabout kind of way I need to kind of help people understand that that sore finger is a part of a whole, just like reproductive health is a part of an entire system. So the things that we breathe in, the things that we put on our skin, the things that we put in our mouths, the things that you know we experience in our day to day are all going to have an effect on how our body works in one way or another, okay? So when it comes to cleaning products, the effects are various because there are many different types of molecules and of components and compounds and ingredients that have different effects in our body. So, you know, some, some uh, products will have, you know, the volatile component of them, like you breathe, for example, ammonia or bleach. You know, you will breathe that in. You may not even get it close to your hands. You might be wearing gloves. You might be, you know... But it doesn't matter because just the breathing of it has an impact on how your organs will perceive that chemical, okay? If you don't clean with gloves, which God forbid that would be the case, you know, especially if you're using um, cleaning products, you're going to be absorbing the skin, Angela, absorbs whatever compound is put on it three times more in greater amounts than what you eat through your mouth. Imagine that right? So we literally will be able to have a higher dose of that chemical inside the body by having it on our skin than if we were to ingest it, if we were to drink it. So hence the absolute importance of making sure that we are using pr protective, you know, equipment when we are doing cleaning jobs. And, you know, there are, there's the usual household cleaning, and then there is the really kind of deep household cleaning. And then there is the 
attics and the, you know, kind of whatever kind of people we, we want you to do. And in those types of cleaning jobs, even more so, you know, the entire protected gear of like suits and masks and, you know, face masks and eye goggles and all of those things is vital because whatever is in that environment is going to end up in your body in one way, shape or form. So whether And it's- I think that's a key. I think a lot of house cleaners don't realize that their lungs are also filtering out, like you mentioned, the fumes with the bleach and the ammonia and things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Their lungs are acting as a filter and their respiratory system is going into high gear when we use some very strong yeah. cleaning chemical and it may not be necessary to use something as strong. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's almost like the lungs will be acting as a filter and a sponge at the same time, right? So it's like it's literally sucking it all into the system. So what happens is that when we are sucking all of these things into the system, then what happens is that the body has to treat it somehow, right? It has to work on it somehow. And so what happens from there is going to be dependent on many other factors and many other pathways of what's going on in the body. That's called epigenetics. You know, when it comes to um, the way in which the environment has a relationship with what happens in the body, like we have all of our genes, but the way that our genes will kind of uh, essentially show up in our day to day and what kind of diseases we may be predisposed to or we may be affected by will be dependent on how our genes respond. And that response is called epigenetics, okay? So for example, we know, we all know or have heard of stories of people who have never smoked a day in their life and die of lung cancer or are diagnosed with lung cancer. And we've also heard of people who are chain smokers and never develop lung cancer. Right. Now, why does that happen? That happens because of this you know, uh, piece that I'm talking about right now. It's how our bodies respond to the environment that it will dictate essentially what predispositions or what we develop in our lifetime. So when it comes to chemicals and chemical products, there are different categories and there are different types and there are you know, different ways in which they, they show up in different products and so on. But the takeaway of all of those different types of chemicals is the same, is that they will have an impact on a cellular level on what's going on with the body. And most cleaning products, they have an impact on uh, hormonal glands, okay, so the endocrine system. So these hormonal glands, they are the ones that communicate, you know, like our ovaries will communicate with our with our thyroid, which will communicate with our pituitary in the brain, which will then, you know, kind of have this feedback loop to release the egg for ovulation or in the case of males to produce sperm. When these pathways are affected or they are obstructed because of different chemicals or different exposures, then those loops and balance that would ordinarily happen in terms of hormones, they break down, right? They become disconnected. There's little diff- there's a difficulty of communication between those systems, uh, between those cells and between the, the, you know, those pathways. And so they become disrupted. And when they become disrupted, we start to see symptoms. And sorry, and those symptoms, they will be, they will range from many different things from imbalance cycles from, you know, say irregular cycles to the inability to conceive to the inability to keep a pregnancy to term and increase risk of miscarriage, fibroids, endometriosis, you know, you name it. There's lots of different symptoms that will arise. Well, and one of the things that we have seen over the years is we've seen a lot of house cleaners who have had challenges trying to conceive because they are affected by either their diets or the things that they're breathing or whatever. And I know that as mothers, we, we have more of a tendency to think about, well, I'm the mother, here's what, you know, is affecting me. But tell me about the, uh, the cleaning effects and how that might affect the fetus of, of a baby that's not born yet. Yeah, that's such a great question. Okay, so I will say one thing that I think is important. In fact, two things that I think are really important to understand this. First, Fertility is a team sport, okay? So it is not just to do with the female. And you can have a woman do all of the right things and still have sperm from a male that is really under par and that will produce increased risk of miscarriage and difficulty in conceiving, 
Okay, so what many people don't understand that a miscarriage, for example, or the loss of a child in utero is actually 40% to do with female factor, 40% to do with male factor, and 20% to do with embryonic factor. Wow, okay? I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. And many people don't, right? So it, like, say those couples that cling together, that are, you know, that are exposed to those chemicals together, they will both be impacted from a reproductive perspective, you know, from, from that hormonal balance perspective. So that's the first thing that we need to understand is that fertility is a team sport. The second thing we need to understand, and this is incredibly critical, Fertility is, and this is a very big word, but it's passed on through generations. It's what's known as transgenerational, okay? But basically because those generations, like, you know, we now know that what our grandmother ate impacts the quality of our health today. Isn't that fascinating, right? And we also know that what you do today as a mother or as a prospective mother will impact your child's health and their child's health. So we need to take those things into account when we are talking about fertility, because sometimes the majority of people, and in fact, in, in populations, the truth is that most people conceive without trying. It's really just a very small percentage of the population where people have severe issues. And just because it's a small percentage, it doesn't make it any easier, you know, for someone going through infertility. At this stage, you know, we know that one in six couples experiences difficulty in conceiving and keeping a healthy pregnancy to term. You know, miscarriages are highly, highly likely. And sometimes what happens is that most people, mothers, most prospective mothers, they don't know that they're pregnant um, until much later on. So what happens is for many couples that are struggling to see a positive pregnancy test, sometimes what's happening is that they are conceiving, but they're not actually implantation isn't happening. You know, the embryo, that baby is not sticking. And so miscarriages keep occurring before you actually have the opportunity to do a pregnancy test to see a positive result. Or they do a pregnancy test, see a positive result, and then a few weeks down the track, unfortunately, they, they lose the baby. But the chemicals and the exposure to those chemicals, in fact, the exposure to anything that could be detrimental to a, to a developing embryo, to a developing baby, are things that are in our day-to-day. -day. Like, for example, you know, something that we may not even realise – you know those fragrance products, you know those kind of like sprays and those things that people put on in their cars and in their, like, you know, those those dangly things. That's I am to not a fan of those. No, I get around okay. those and they just make my eyes go bloodshot and my nose uh, is like, like uh, this. Please, and then uh, I, I, I'm like, why do people do this? And yeah. they're popular and they're, they, you know, you go into a house and they got the little plug in thing and it, uh, it sprits stuff in the air. I'm like, stop, please stop. Uh, exactly. <laughs> And you know what? Exactly. And you know, it's one of the most toxic things that people could do. And most people don't understand that because it's marketed so well with literally multi-millions of dollars, people think, oh, that sounds like a good idea, right? And they all, oh, you know, it masks this particular smell. Well, let's look at why the smell is there to begin with, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and let's try and address that because all of those types of things that we don't even think about, you know, like even um, during the pandemic, I mean, one of the hugest things was uh, hand sanitizers. You know, mm -hmm. hand sanitizers are full of triclosan. That is a chemical that's directly related to hormonal imbalances and endocrine disruption. So, you know, the truth of the matter is that these chemicals are prevalent and pervasive in our day to day and in our environment. We can't help the fact that they're sold in every supermarket and we also can't help the fact that when they are present in a place have you ever noticed when you you might be in a supermarket and the second that you go into the cleaning product aisle the smell is so strong have you ever noticed that or you, have you become desensitized to the smell of cleaning products <laughs> no fortunately i try to stay out of the cleaning aisle at the stores yeah. because when i go inside people are like oh my gosh i got a question and i'm like whoa <laughs> how, how did you know i was here but i i do usually buy my cleaning supplies um through a supplier and we buy them in bulk and concentrates yeah, yeah. and then and we dilute places them. right but you put it in a room right does that room smell different it does. It does. And you know what? It's interesting yeah. because we ask customers when we show up at their house, how will you know your house is clean? 
And it's a great question to find out their barometer of what they're, they're thinking clean is. Yes. And um, oddly enough, a lot of people will say, my house will smell clean. Yeah. And then we have to have an educational conversation about clean doesn't have a smell. Yes. And if there's something in your house that smells, you have issues of a different sort, right? It's not, it's not that your house is clean. It's that something smells. Yeah. I don't want somebody to come in and just spray smelly stuff in the house and go, oh, your house is clean. That's I, right. I want you to actually remove the dust and I want you to clean it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is why, you know, the whole, the dream, right? But no, the point is, and this is the point that I'm making, whether you walk in the aisle of a supermarket or whether you store your chemicals that have arrived, you know, somehow in your workplace or your home, there is a different smell. And that in itself is a cue. It's and a clue mm -hmm. of the fact that you are literally breathing in these chemicals. Okay. Well, so tell me, tell me this, if it's not just cleaning chemicals, it's probably also everything that smells like laundry detergent, absolutely, and soaps that? and deodorants and, and things like that, that. The plastic containers that they come in, there's basically that plastic will leach into the product as well. And that plastic, you know, mostly phthalates, bisphenols, you know, these very kind of uh, potent chemicals that are, you know, have an impact on hormones. So you're absolutely right. It's not just what you use to clean, but it's how you do your laundry, how you brush your teeth, how what shampoo you use, what soap you use, all of those things. And this is a piece that I have to educate my patients on all the time because we know the really detrimental impact that some cleaning products, most commercially available cleaning products can have. And because our patients come to us typically after many years of infertility, having experienced you know, miscarriages in the past and, and the like, we need to look and assess their entire life, not just mm -hmm. what they're doing in terms of the food that they eat or the exercise that they do or, you know, what treatments they have had. We really need to kind of like it's almost this diagnostic of their life going deep into what else is there that is impacting you. One of the things that I talk to my patients all the time is this the importance of ensuring that not only that they are not and this is kind of different for your audience and it's and I want to say this, I want to say that in the same way that not every person who smokes is going to be affected in, in this way, right? Not everybody who uses cleaning products is going to be affected in this way. However, there will be some effect. We know mm -hmm. that the person who didn't develop lung cancer perhaps had a stroke or had a cardiovascular disease or had emphysema or had, you know, other conditions that were related to the exposure that they had so no exposure is neutral okay mm -hmm. when when we're talking about toxic chemicals okay the only best way to reduce the impact of those things is by changing the the exposures that we find ourselves facing right and so understanding what it is that we're using to what degree how we're protecting ourselves following the guidelines of making sure that you have, you know, open windows and, you know, all of those things is all going to help. But we can't expect that, you know, and, and, and storing chemicals, you know, cleaning products or otherwise underneath the sink, it's going to permeate your whole house. Mm -hmm. No matter what, those volatile organic compounds are the very thing, the things that we breathe in are the very mechanism in which these chemicals impact hormonal health and reproductive health. Wow. And general health. health. I love this. Uh, we have a comment that came in. Uh, May says, my mom used bleach her whole life, smokes and drinks daily, 73, still healthy. Maybe working out is helping sweat it out. Our house cleaner is now in the 90s, still alive, has seven children, including uh, twins, another three. A move out cleaner, works with ammonia for 34 years, still strong and healthy, but she could never conceive. So this is really interesting to me because we're, I, I hear stories like this all the time. I hear stories of house cleaners who have had either complications or they have not been able to get pregnant or they've had just physical, uh, what do you call it, repercussions from cleaning chemicals that they've either inhaled or heaven forbid they've mixed and it's had a, a weird reaction. And I, I just, I just can't, uh, express the importance enough of this conversation. Rachel mm -hmm. says, wow, an another life-changing discussion. Thank you for your ongoing dedication to support and teach others, Angela, and thank you, Gabriella. Wow. Yes. Thank you, Rachel, uh, for dropping in and saying hello. 
We also have uh, several other people here that have jumped in and uh, saying hi to us. And thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you that are just joining us, I'm here with Gabriella Rosa, and she is a fertility expert sharing with us cleaning chemicals and the effect that it has on fertility. And so I'm really curious, at what point of your reproductive health, let's say from being a teenager to getting ready to conceive, should you start paying attention to cleaning chemicals? <laughs> like remember how I was saying before how fertility is multi-generational in its impact right uh -huh. so the best time to start paying attention to cleaning chemicals is three generations forward so you know you really are looking at the health of your grandchildren here <laughs> wow <laughs> and uh and, and look mind you of course you know there is always a situation where we don't know what we don't know Mm -hmm. Right. There will always be times. And I think that there's also such an important conversation to have that we have to have compassion for ourselves, you know, in the things that we don't know, because it's really easy to go, oh, my God, I should have known that. I can't believe that I don't know that. The truth is we're not none of us is born knowing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, we do our best and we learn along the way. So I think that first that self-compassion and that ability to to look at ourselves and just do our best is so important, right? Um, the, following on from that, it's it's then looking at, okay, now that I understand this information or that I have this new knowledge that I didn't know before, how can I or what can I do to help myself, right? What can I do? And especially if somebody is trying to get pregnant right now or they have experienced reproductive difficulties or challenges or everything else, like, we then need to ask the very specific, very, very good question of like, okay, what can I influence? Also understanding that for many people, this is a occupational hazard. It's a, a hazard that is coming um, from work, from the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're living your life and you're, you're making it work and it is work and it's your livelihood. So it's like, you know, I've had patients in my clinic who have come to me because they worked as clinic as cleaners or they um they worked in, in chemical plants and so on and so forth and I, what i always say to them changing jobs is always the last resort because that just becomes an extra stress uh, on mm -hmm. top of everything else right and fertility treatment in isn't exactly cheap right mm -hmm. it isn't exactly free so you've got to actually figure out okay well how do i make this work whilst still you know, protecting my health, protecting my fertility and so on. So what I like to always say to people is the first step is how do we start from where we are and make the biggest but in a positive change that we can. And for some people, it might literally just be using protective equipment. You know, like I had a man once who worked in a um, in an aluminium factory and he would use, wear absolutely and use absolute no protective equipment and I'm like are you crazy <laughs> like the workplace provided it and he was like oh no it doesn't matter you know and we found that his fertility problems were specifically related to aluminium exposure so then at that point we're like okay you know what you need to wear everything from the suit to the goggles to the to the thing to the you know to the to the uh, mask to every single thing and when you get home you literally you remove everything you have a shower at work and then you go home because otherwise also what's happening is you're bringing all of those chemicals into your own home, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another very important thing. Like for, for people who do cleaning as a job, my recommendation would be the, sec the, the last job of the day, you get changed, mm -hmm. put everything in a bag and you go home already with different clothes because no matter what, you would have touched your clothes, you would have, and, and in their clothes will be dirt, dust, grime, cleaning, cleaning products, you know, you name it. I mean, I know I did the job. So, <laughs> well, you know, and it's funny because who knows, who knows what it's really like to clean houses all day, every day, except house cleaners. And exactly. as, you come in, as you come into my house from my garage, I have a laundry room right there to the side and it has a great big, enormous tree in front of it. So you can't see out the window from the neighbors. And I literally would strip off all my clothes and leave them right there yeah. because I don't want them in the rest of my house. But exactly. I would come in and I would have, and not just cleaning chemicals, but I would have dog hair and I would have yeah. dust and yeah. I would have all kinds of stuff that had 
just come in contact with me throughout the whole day. And Precisely. I didn't want to then cross contaminate, take all that stuff through my house, even to go to my bedroom and just, you know, change in the closet. Exactly. So I wanted to just get everything off right there. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because we, we are aware, but many of us don't make choices about our own health. I mean, we, we noticed, uh, and I don't know, I was probably in the business for five or six years before I learned about HEPA filtration with vacuums. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I started thinking, wait a second, they're making vacuum cleaners with HEPA filtration. What does that mean? Yeah. And when I started thinking through it, you know, logically, that it's removing the particulates out of the air, wait a second, if they're making vacuums that have HEPA filtration, what am I breathing yes. if I'm the one that's working around the dust and things like that? And that's oh. just along with those cleaning chemicals. We talk exactly. about personal protective equipment, but it's not usually until we do like a deep cleaning project and there's a lot of dust or something that we even put a face mask on. No, but and there this is actually a, such an important point that you make. And I have to stop you there for one second because, you know, we treat in my clinic, we treat people with serious health conditions as well that are causing their fertility problems typically. And mm -hmm. one of the most serious that most people don't realize, and cleaners would be in contact with this all the time, is mold. Mm. Mold is literally, it's one of the worst possible exposures that a person could have. And when you are cleaning mold in particular, literally, like I would recommend hair covers, I would recommend like literally goggles, I would recommend masks, I would recommend gloves, I would recommend different clothing. And literally all of that stuff needs to be completely stripped before you even get in your car. Mm. Right, because all of that is going to end up in your car, that eventually is going to end up in your clean clothes from your wardrobe, right? And then getting back into the house. So, I totally, totally agree with you that you know, sometimes it's the things that we don't think about that we are doing that we can potentially start to look at it and examine and go, okay, well, how do I need to do this differently? Because otherwise we end up with more of the same, right? So that's a really critical piece that you bring to the table. There. Well, and, and it's interesting because when you, we start talking about mold, a lot of house cleaners will go straight for the bleach when it comes to the mold. So now they've got mold plus bleach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got news, I got news for you. The mold might look better, but what does the insides of you look like right I know, I know and that's that is definitely a tricky thing it's definitely tricky because it's like you know it, there is that trade-off it's almost we do need to kind of figure out okay well how what is the best way to approach this and so going back to that piece of, of the conversation it's like what are, it really it's about examining it's about mm -hmm. looking very deliberately at every part of your job and every way in which you do something and question can I be doing this better for my health? Can mm -hmm. I be doing this better for myself, right? And, of course, if they're not sure, if they would like some extra tips and whatever else, you know, I'm sure that you'd be very happy to answer those questions. But it's about first becoming conscious of what mm -hmm. it is that we're doing, examining that and going, right, what is the next step? What, how, if I was to make one tiny improvement here, what could it be? You know, even at, when I was a cleaner, quite seriously, like my, my bit, like I will never, even in my own house now, you know, as I do, you know, clean, um, I basically will never, ever, ever use any particular, on my surfaces, I use a microfiber cloth with water. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like, and I do that for everything. My floor, I literally use, and I never, ever, and this is another thing that you should educate all of your clients on, uh, for all the ladies and gentlemen listening to this, is to never walk into the house with shoes, mm. right? Like, never, ever. Why? Because the poo from the dog and the geese and the whatever else that's out there immediately is going to end up on your bed. How mm -hmm. so? Well, you walk with your shoes inside the house, you walk all around the house, you have a shower, you walk barefoot on the floor. Guess what? That, those particles, and, and then you get onto your bed, those particles are under your covers. I was thinking about this the other day because I was doing a TikTok video and we have, <laughs> in, my, in my neighbourhood, um, we have these Canada geese everywhere, right? 
And every time that I'm walking outside, I'm literally like tiptoeing around the, the, the poo, you know, of these animals. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, imagine I never, ever walk into my house with shoes. I have like a shoe rack literally on the side of the door to make sure that that never happens. But, you know, so many people don't realize and they don't know. So it's about looking and putting those little things in place, right, where you're literally looking at your behaviors, your actions, and figuring out how can I be making micro improvements? Because those tiny, tiny improvements of habit will add up to a big thing. Like on my floors, because, you know, I will use vinegar and water or I'll use, you know, so it just really depends as well on, and even when I was cleaning like actual houses, I would do pretty much the same. Like the mopping of the floor, I used just to mop with with water. The the vacuuming and then, of course, the bathroom, you know, it's, it's a little bit different and there's different things that you need to do in terms of that. But just reduce the amount of chemicals as much as you possibly can because that's definitely going to make a huge, huge difference. Well, and I'm a big fan of reading safety data sheets. Safety data sheets give us a lot of information. And it will tell us, don't use this chemical unless there's good ventilation in the room. And it will tell us, here's the warning, like we have warnings on the sides of the cigarette containers that say, mm. this, will, this will kill you. We have, we have warnings on the safety data sheets that say, keep out of the reach of children and animals and keep it in a cool, dry place, isolated from everything yeah. else. Yeah. And it will tell us what the hazards are with little pictograms that show, you know, somebody's heart exploding and things and like if that. It tell, and if it tells you that, literally run and do not use that product. <laughs> but it, it's important to know. It's, it's important, important to, know. to know because there there are it's it's easy. And you asked about the grocery store aisles. It's very easy to be bamboozled by fancy yes. advertising. Yes. And you walk down the store yes. shelf, and what, what happens is it triggers this cool commercial you saw on TV of all mm -hmm. these people that were happy and they were dancing around and they were effortlessly cleaning with this particular product. And if you don't look at the safety data sheet, sometimes those beautifully packaged products, like you said, billions of dollars in advertising mm -hmm. are going to make you buy that and take it home with you thinking, oh, here's the, the next big fast solution. Yeah. But the yeah. reality is there are so many cleaning chemicals that are on the store shelves that are so incredibly hazardous to your health. Oh, 100%. Even even if you're not trying to have children. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Just no. as far as breathing and there yeah. will be notes on the safety data sheet that says this kills aquatic life. Keep it out of the lakes and rivers and streams. <laughs> like, <laughs> Honestly, why? every time I read this, every time I because you make total sense. I mean, that's obvious, right? Why are right. we looking these things? You know, like it's the same thing that you were talking about in terms of warnings on cigarette labels. Yes. <laughs> like you're going to die if you smoke people, but still it just keeps on going. Right. So I totally hear what you're saying. I think that the key aspect, you know, like everything in life, it's really about the fact that we need to, it's a trade-off. It's always going to be a trade-off and there will be times where you are going to reach out for that thing that's going to make your job easier, right? Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then you need to be aware, how can I be reducing my exposures elsewhere? How can I be streamlining what else I do so that I protect my health? And mm -hmm. utilize those those moments where you really, you know, like I, <laughs> I've moved to Boston recently. I'm doing a doctorate at Harvard, as you said. And so, you know, in my home in Sydney, um, we, with my kids and, you know, like I have a nanny and, you know, it's just this whole very blissful life where, you know, I have everything done for me and it's wonderful. Here, it's very, very different. <laughs> Where I'm kind of, you know, I'm studying, I'm working, I'm doing all of the things and I'm cleaning my own house. And so what and what that has brought to me in terms of like a, a reminder of the fact that it's what I do on a daily basis and what I do on a more frequent basis that makes more of a difference than what I do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And because you see, normally at home, I would instruct the person who's cleaning my house, do not use any chemicals whatsoever. I want you to use bicarb soda, vinegar, and water, and that's it, right? Here, I've scrubbed that tub. I have done whatever it is that I could do with water, bicarb soda, and vinegar, and it's still not taking the thing off. The other day, I went to Target, and I got this spray thing, and it was like, you know what? This is amazing. So I did that, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do that once a month because 
my life is also short. <laughs> you know, so I open all the windows and I do. Now, it's not ideal. And certainly if I was trying to get pregnant, I would think three times, probably, you know, a little bit more. But, I'm, you know, and even so, I mean, even though I'm not trying to get pregnant, hormonal health is important throughout life, right? And so I want to make sure, and, you know, I see on the comments um, someone asking about polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. I have PCOS. So, you know, which is a, basically it's the number one cause of infertility in women of a reproductive age, which it causes the, the ovulation to be irregular. And there's a few things that I'll say about this in terms of the context that we're talking about. But the important thing is to understand that taking care of your health is literally a moment to moment situation. And you have to be asking questions moment by moment, because otherwise these things that we think are little, right, they accumulate. And so, and that's really the key takeaway of this whole conversation is that you might think that, oh, you know, it's okay. I'm only just using this little bit of this cleaning product here and, and it doesn't really matter. But for eight houses that you've cleaned in that week, if you've used that little bit eight times, guess what? You've just put yourself in an exposure that is probably about 10 times or more higher than the average person, right? Because the average person probably is cleaning their own house every two, you know, two times a month, really, right? Um, unless you're a cleaning freak like me. But... <laughs> But the reality of it is that most people are not going to have the same level of exposure that somebody that cleans houses for a living would have. And that's where we need to be very careful, right? Because your exposure, Angela, is going to be, you know, multiple compared to just a general, you know, kind of general life. Now, in terms of... Um, in terms of Spe uh, Spectraman, who basically has asked about um, difficulty struggling with PCOS and intermittent cycles, trying to make another baby, you know, definitely this is certainly something that is important for us to take into account because of the impact that it will have on hormonal, li hormonal levels. But the other thing that I will say in terms of polycystic ovarian syndrome is that you also need to be very careful because for many women with PCOS, we tend to have difficulty with losing weight. And when you are overweight, we store chemicals and toxins in our fat tissue, okay? So for all cleaners out there who perhaps are overweight, and actually I heard a fabulous study the other day that I want to share with you, um, but for, for cleaners who perhaps, you know, might be overweight, you do have to be careful because you will be storing more toxins than the person who perhaps is not overweight, right? So that's going to be something that's really important as well. Um, the other thing that I was going to say, there was a study that I, I heard of the other day, which is intentional, you know, like how do you put your intention towards, like especially in terms of being overweight. The study separated two groups and it looked that, you know, one group of women basically were just observe, observed and nothing really was done in terms of educating them on anything. The other group was educated as to the intention of what it is that they were doing. They were told that, you know, th that if they if they um, cleaned briskly, that they would um, be able to improve um, how their body operated in terms of blood sugar levels. They would be able to uh, burn extra calories. They would be able to, and there was a whole list of benefits that they were described as to, you know, that physical activity improving their skin tone and their, their, their just health in general and so on, their fit levels of fitness and, and et cetera. And after a month, they actually went to compare those two groups with no other intervention. And they, would, they, they saw that the group that was actually told as to the benefits that they had that intentionality behind what it is that they were doing um, actually lost weight. They felt better. They felt, felt fit, fitter and had, you know, a very distinct difference in terms of physical conditioning between the two groups. So I think that it's really, you know, it's interesting for us to also look at, you know, that what it is that we do and how we do it, because chemicals on the environment, they impact the way in which our body operates. If we are thinking about the fact that, oh my God, I'm using this thing and it's killing me, that's not going to be good for you either. Right. Okay. Well, so, you brought up something really interesting a minute ago where you said, I used a cleaning chemical and it did a really great job. And I'm yeah. a really big fan of using a cleaning chemical 
to do a specific job. Yes. And the question is this, and this is where I draw the line because it does come down to my health. And I've got the awareness for myself that there's only one version of me. And we yes. do live in a, a technological age where we can have knees replaced and you know valves replaced and whatever, but there's one version of me. And if I do my best job to keep track of my health right now, that's less I have to try to replace later on. But I'm very keenly aware that there are chemicals that are used for specific things. Mm -hmm. Am I cleaning one of those things right now? And if the answer is no, I don't need a really strong chemical. I do not need to use it. Like you said, I could use a microfiber cloth to wipe things down and to keep it sanitary because microfiber does a great job of doing that. That said, there are times I will use a strong chemical because mm -hmm. it is required. However, if I'm going to use a stronger chemical, it goes back to what you said about the personal protective equipment. Yes. I need to double up on my personal protective equipment. I need to make sure I've got my gloves on, that I have a face mask on, that I have clothing. And I usually wear a great big long apron, like one of those great big ones that yeah. the butchers use. <laughs> <laughs> You're prepared. So, just so that I can protect my clothing because in a minute I'm going to take that off and then I, do, I don't want my regular clothing to, to be covered in that. And I know that yeah. there's only so much of a barrier you can create, yeah. but then I don't want to breathe that. And literally when I climb inside a shower and I have to spray something, like you said, you're talking about mold, if I have to use a stronger chemical, I will jump in, I will hold my breath and yeah. I will jump in and spray as fast as I can. And then I will dip back out of the shower and like take another breath, hold my breath and go in again and spray some more just so that I'm not like, you know, inhaling that and breathing that as I go. It's every single precaution you can make every step of the way, yeah. because the reality is after 30 years in the cleaning business, my health can only repair itself so many times. Oh, and every percent. time I'm face to face with all those cleaning chemicals. It can, it can really take a toll on you. And Absolutely. I don't think just in terms of my organs, but like also my brain. Oh, and for so sure. It impacts the entire system. And you see, the thing is, and this is also another very important point, is that the cleaning products for cleaners is not the only toxic exposure that we are exposed to in our day to day. Unfortunately, our food is not as clean as it used to be. Our environment, the breathing air that we breathe outside is not as clean. So the thing about it is that we all have these extra exposures, right? These additional exposures of, of food, of water. You know, there was, there was a study that was published recently that showed that in unfiltered water, and most people unfortunately drink unfiltered water, in unfiltered water, there are almost a thousand chemicals found present in unfiltered water, in a glass of unfiltered water, a glass. So anything from Prozac to the oral contraceptive pill is in there. So imagine. Well, when you stop to think about it, and here's what really caught my attention years ago, because I, I started drinking bottled water or mm -hmm. filtered water. I had a, one of those filters that hooks up to your sink. But I started thinking, wait a second, I'm going inside people's homes and they've got hair dye that's splattered all over their tubs and they're doing the do it yourself hair dye. Where's that hair dye going? I'm like, oh, it's going into the water system. And then I started thinking about like washing machines, like you pour all, you know, a yes. cap full of yes. dish, uh, laundry soap inside your laundry. And then what happens? Well, it goes back into your, your processing systems. And granted, we have systems that try to filter all that stuff out, but there've got to be traces of that stuff that, of that, course. that Absolutely. sneak through. And, and so I'm thinking know, for all the chemicals and all of the hair dye and all of the stuff that people are washing down the drains, <laughs> thinking, wow, that's really amazing that we would then try to turn around and, you know, use that as our good, our good, clean water. Yeah, exactly. And hence why it's so vital to actually have a triple filter water system under your, because you see also, this is the other thing with um, plastic bottles, you know, plastics, plastics are the bane of hormonal existence. Mm -hmm. Okay, balance of hormonal balance existence, because anything that contains plastic, whether it's something like plastic wrap on food, plastic bottles for water, plastic containers for whatever, it has a massively impacting effect on hormonal balance on endocrine glands. Okay, so what happens is that we need to really look at our whole lives and go, okay, how do I reduce these exposures? Because it, there is no way of avoiding them. There is mm -hmm. absolutely no chance that we can avoid all exposures. There, there just isn't. You know, they, like, you know, um, those uh, 
pans that are nonstick pans. All of those things, highly toxic. I'm part of a, of a research group at Harvard that we look at exactly these forever chemicals. You wow. know, we look at these plastics and forever chemicals and bleaches and all of these types of things and the effect that they have on endocrine health. And, you know, study after study is published with the, find, the same findings, that these things make a distinct difference in the way in which our body self-regulates. So, and, and the impact that it has, that it actually disrupts that self-regulation. Hence why we end up with situations like reproductive disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, fibroids, endometriosis, you know, all of these types of things, prostate cancers, you know, prostate imbalances, etc. So, it's not to say that we, and we can't avoid any of those things. So really what we need to do is we need to reduce all the other exposures that we can. So instead of drinking unfiltered water from the tap, get a water filter. That reduces your exposure. Instead of using nonstick pans, get stainless steel. Instead of, you know, like, so it's looking at where are the places that we actually have some influence and how do we behave and act and change in the best possible way to protect ourselves because like you said there's only so much that the body can take in continual exposure before it goes you know what i'm out that's mm -hmm. it i'm done mm -hmm. well and it's interesting because my husband and i were having a talk the other day about we call them made-up diseases when we were kids there weren't all these weird diseases that people have today and right now, if you watch TV, like especially if you watch it late at night, then all these commercials will come on that will have these these diseases I never heard of before. And then it will say, ask your doctor if this is right for you. And there's a new medication about a new oh disease. Yeah. And I'm like, where are all these diseases coming from? Yeah. And I, I have to think that because our air is not as clean, because our food is more processed than ever before. And full of chemicals, unfortunately. We're breathing chemicals. chemicals and it's, I, I know that as a, as a world, we're becoming more conscientious. Um, and it's, it's small steps that people are taking. My husband brought this to me the other day. And I said, what is this? And he said, it's your window washer fluid. I said, why is it so small? And he said, it's a concentrate. Yeah, and he said, they're getting away from single use plastics. And so here's, here's your window washer fluid and you mix it in with a gallon of water. And I was like, whoa. And I love to see that because we're getting away from the waste and the, the over-processing yes. and the landfills and we're, we're yeah. trying to reduce. Yes, and, so and Angela. Yes, and. Because, in, you know, this is, the, this is the challenge is that when they do things like that and they concentrate these chemicals so much, the impact is even greater. Right. Mm. And so, it, yes, it's great from the perspective of the environment that we're not having such big things and landfill and all of those things. And yet we still have to question, do we really need it? Mm. You know, I think mm -hmm. that that really is the biggest takeaway, because you see, the thing is, those high, it, it, sure, you will put those, those um, chemicals in the thing, you will spritz it into the air, it's going to end up in, in the environment anyway. Right. And so, I think that that's really the, the piece that we all need to come to as humanity is to ask ourselves, like, what is really essential and what are we making up as essential, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Like, I'm just saying, I, I think that the more aware that we can become in asking and discerning, you know, asking ourselves the question of like, what is really, really important here? And, and what, do I really need this, right? Because if you can get away with not needing it um, rather than making up the story in our minds that we need it, mm -hmm. then I think that that's a really good place that we get to. Um, so I think it's just it's just a by the by. There was a, a comment here about um, cast iron. I love, love, love cast iron uh, pans when we were talking about the nonstick. Um, absolutely love cast iron. The only thing that um, men need to be aware about in terms of cast iron, it, for women it's fine because especially menstruating women because we will menstruate and we are, our iron levels are going to reduce as a result of menstruation. And so cast iron pans are actually fantastic <laughs> for women because most women, unfortunately, are iron deficient. However, for men, it can bioaccumulate and men don't have the same, you know, kind of physiology of menstruation. And so what happens is that 
um, they will accumulate iron and, and excess iron in the body can be toxic. So that's why, you know, I love cast iron. I use cast iron. I, I love steel carbon as well, which is another type of, you know, kind of cast iron pan. Um, and for men who perhaps, you know, might need to have a different uh, kind of exposure, stainless steel is also a really good idea. Well, I love this conversation because it's it certainly got us thinking about a lot of different things. Yes, yes. But I think I think the big overarching grasp of this conversation is that we are affected by the environment that we live in. And every choice we make is a choice. And so if we're just flaw, you know, drifting aimlessly and we're not paying attention, it could be affecting our health in long-term effects. And like you said, it's three generations down the road. A hundred percent. And and sorry to just add this, but the thing that I think is so vital, and I want everyone to take this away from this conversation, is the fact that when it comes to fertility, especially whether it's inability to conceive, inability to keep a healthy pregnancy to term, just general reproduction, there is no such thing as a neutral exposure. Okay, there's nothing that you will do that will just have no exposure. Every single thing that you will do will either have a positive exp exposure, uh, uh, you know, it will be a positive exposure or it will be a negative exposure. There's nothing that's just going to be in the middle. So, for example, what do I mean by that? Well, you might say on the conversation of um, filtered water, unfiltered water is going to have a negative exposure. It's going to be a negative exposure, right? But then there's the greens because is it better than alcohol for fertility? Yes, it is. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so rather so than there's green, alcohol and then there's unfiltered water and then so, there's filtered water. Exactly. So I'll say, you know, there's alcohol, unfiltered water, filtered water. So, you know, the reality is that in that kind of spectrum, you will have different levels of exposure of positive and negative as well. And what, what I hear you saying is make the better bad choice. Begs, exactly. Always make the best possible choice you can. There won't be a perfect choice. Mm -hmm. You know, there won't be something that's, you know, it's going to always be the And it, a choice sometimes is not going to be, we're not going to be able to make that choice consistently mm -hmm. every single time. Right. But if in the situation that you find yourself in, there is a way of making a slightly better choice than a worse one, then make the slightly better one. Mm -hmm. Right. And know that you're working towards improving that every single time. I think that mitigation. Yes. I think that's a really good way of going about it because, you know, and in some instances, I will say this as a, as a clinician and as a fertility specialist, you know, who specifically help couple, helps couples overcome infertility and miscarriage. There are situations that I will have to say, no, you cannot make this choice. Like mm -hmm. you have to make this other choice because otherwise what you're telling me that you want, which is a baby, is just not going to happen, mm -hmm. right? So there are, there have been situations I have had to tell people over the years, no, you have to change jobs. There is absolutely, for you, there is absolutely no other way. So, you know, you either do that or you have no baby. And that's also a choice. Well, and uh, I think there's something to be said about that because there are some children that are brought into the, the earth under circumstances where the parents were not careful with their health or they made poor choices about their, their health and it affected the children. And the children had all kinds of, you know, they had to be incubated or they were born prematurely or they had health challenges that chase them around for the next several years of their lives and, and all those things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have to start thinking in terms of, we only have one version of us. And if we are going to reproduce, it's probably a good idea to be on high alert about the things that we eat and the things that we drink and the things that we breathe and the cleaning chemicals that we use so that we are giving ourselves. And like you said, three generations down the road, the best chance possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. The best, you know, really, truly, the best start in life starts way before life starts. And so, you know, it's about being deliberate. It's about being aware. It's about being prepared. You know, I think that to a huge extent. And look, there are different types of populations and subpopulations under populations, right? There are situations where, for the most part, like I started this conversation, in the general population out there, people conceive without trying. 
really people have one night stands drunken one night stands and get pregnant <laughs> that is True. literally how most people no i'm serious that is how most people get pregnant right however there are subpopulations within populations there are then the people who the drunken night one night stand is not going to do the thing right mm -hmm. and the the really diligent you know eating healthy organic and this and that still is not doing the thing mm -hmm. right so there's those layers those variations that we were talking about of best choices and and not so great choices they happen even like and and for couples who struggle to have you know a healthy pregnancy they are a different type of population they're a population that needs to be looked at in a very different way and so you know sometimes like you know people might say to me yeah but you know my neighbor my auntie my parrot you know they drink they smoke they do all of the wrong things and they get pregnant and here i am actually i call it the heroin addict syndrome i had a patient once in front of me so angry and bawling her eyes out and telling me you know maybe i should just shoot up heroin maybe then i'll get pregnant and i was like okay that's random in my own <laughs> mind going um how do i respond to that and then she continued she said you know yeah because you know here i am doing all the right things and not getting pregnant and these people are doing all the wrong things and getting pregnant and then it was the whole conversation of epigenetics the way that one person mm -hmm. is impacted versus another and so on but that's the important thing to realize is that for some people the threshold is much lower than for other people mm -hmm. right and so there is no point in trying to compare yourself if you've had the drunken one night stand with the person who is not having the same luck right after years of trying having done multiple different things to achieve that outcome mm -hmm. it's just different people like you're comparing watermelons with you know peaches they're very different things they're both fruit but they are very different fruit right <laughs> so I well, think it's the same applies here I appreciate conversation. this conversation with us today because this has shed a light on a bunch of really uncomfortable topics and, and maybe some self-reflection that maybe some of us are not paying as close attention to ways that we can live better. And I love your uh, choose, choose the best possible situation in any circumstance approach because if we do pay attention, I mean, it is, it is our health that's on the line. And yeah. I don't think that we're going to randomly get healthier just by drifting aimlessly. I don't think that's exactly. going to happen. Exactly. Oh, thank God you said that. <laughs> I, well, I, 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 think our, I think our world with the with with all of the chemicals and all of the, the airborne contaminants and just the pollution that we have, I, I don't think it's getting better on its own. I think it's going to take everybody doing their, their own little part to try to make a difference, even in your own little world. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you so much on that, you know, like, and I think there's so much to be said for being conscious about our choices in the day to day. You know, sometimes people live so unconsciously and so, you know, lacking deliberateness about improvement. Because if you allow, if you are not deliberate about improvement, entropy, which is the fact that everything just goes, you know, kind of dwindles to its lowest possible common denominator, Mm -hmm. is the definite thing that is going to happen, right? So that's why when people think about aging in many situations, they think about aging as a process of decline because they just think that, okay, well, I'm going to keep doing the same thing that I used to do in my 20s. And, <laughs> and, and, and in my 60s, it will still respond the same. Exactly. And the thing, and, but that's what happens. Rather than realizing that, okay, the thing that I did in my 20s was actually not the thing that's going to keep me at the level of health mm. that I want to be at in my 60s. Mm. Therefore, if I want a different level of health that is improving as opposed to declining, what do I need to do differently? Right. And I actually had this conversation with myself actually quite a few years back. I got into bodybuilding like seriously because I was like, you know what? I actually want to be able to sit on the toilet unassisted at age 90. How am I <laughs> going to do that? You know? So I was like, okay, the best way for me to do that is to maintain my muscle mass. And the best way for me to do that is to do some heavy lifting and to be able to do it deliberately and, and carefully and cautiously so that I can be the healthiest version of myself. And it completely transformed my body and it completely transformed how I thought of life and what's possible, you know, when I am 90. So I think that that's such a key takeaway for people. It's like, don't 
just sit there and drift in your life. You know, really really decide, be deliberate, be conscious, because that is the best way that you can live your best life, irrespective of where you are on a reproductive journey. I love that. Thank you so much for this conversation today. I hate that our time is up. Tell our listeners where they can go to find you. Absolutely. Um, Fertilitybreakthrough.com is where they can go or they can just Google my name, Gabriella Rosa, G-A-B-R-I-E-L-A-R-O-S-A. And if you Google me, Gabriella Rosa Fertility, you will find me. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for being here with us today. I am so honored and I feel so blessed. So on behalf of me and everybody that's joined us today, thank you guys so much. This was awesome. And uh, we we really do appreciate your help. I will leave Absolutely. links to Gabrielle in the, uh, the show notes as well so that you can stay in touch. Thanks, guys. Lovely to have you here as well. <laughs>